Welcome to another edition of the Sim Racing Garage. I am Barry Rowland. In this episode, we will be reviewing the new entry level sim racing wheel kit from Thrustmaster, the T128 wheelbase and T2PM pedal set. At a price point of only $200, it is squarely aimed at the beginning sim racer, or a sim racer that is ready to move up from a basic hand controller. Time to put it through the SRG's review process and see how it does. So, let's get to it. Let's take a closer look at the Thrustmaster T128 force feedback wheel kit. Well, this is a very inexpensive or cheap wheel set. It is a $200 setup with some pedals, which is pretty cheap really for controllers for sim racing. But obviously you're gonna expect some pretty cheap feeling things when it comes out of the box and it does not disappoint in that department. This is all just a hunk of pieces put together of injection molded plastic, four pounds and six ounces. Yeah, very lightweight. That's two kilos for everybody else in the world. And it feels very cheap in hand, but I think what they're trying to do here is get people off of their game pads and get them on proper steering wheels racing in the Xbox, which this one is. You can see the little Xbox thing here. They also have it for the PlayStation. But yeah, I think that's what they're trying to do is get people interested in using a wheel, right? And $200, again, that might not be very cheap for some people, but really, if you look at the rest of the market of controllers, it, it definitely is the lowest price one that I know of currently. I could be wrong, but there might be one out there somewhere that I missed, but yeah, 200 bucks. And again, expectations are being met here. Plastic wheel here. There is some metal here though. This little band here for the angle indicator for your steering wheel. That is kind of like a strip of metal and it's held on by a screw on the back here. We might look at that more when we do our look inside. And 250 millimeter diameter wheel on here. Not too thin, actually. Not too bad. Again, I'm, I'm managing my expectations here for what I think I should be seeing at this price point. Actually, not a lot of flex to it either. I'm trying to get it to flex here, but it won't flex there. I'll probably get it to do it this way. But yeah, it's very stiff plastic in here. The buttons here were a bit of a surprise, actually. Most buttons I've got, even on some of the more expensive wheels that I've reviewed, you know, like a $600 wheel, you push them and they're just like, you know, they're mush until you hit the stop and that's all you get. There's really no tactile feedback to it. But all these buttons have a, some kind of a threshold spring in here, some kind of a spring mechanism that you have to push past it. And that's a click when you do that before you hit the stop. So that gives us a real tactile feel when we're using the buttons. So I was very surprised at that. I was expecting just the usual mush until it stops and that's the button press. But yeah, you actually get a tactile feel here. And we have the usual buttons for the Xbox on here. We have the Xbox Xbox button. We've got a menu button over here. We've got, I believe this is view, and this is a share, and we've got settings over here. Now the settings button is supposed to work on the settings for the wheel two, I believe, in their software, but we'll see that when we get there. Of course, we've got the usual X, Y, B, A buttons over here. We've got the D-pad over here. We got our L and R, S, Bs. And these two red buttons up here with the little, looks like emergency flasher, right? You hit that in your car, it looks like it's an emergency flasher, but they say it's for handbrake. I doubt it's an analog axis, but you can push this button and map it for a brake. And they put it purposely according to their literature so that you can access it with your thumbs very easily. And you can, so if you want to be driving and use your handbrake. But yeah, a little bit surprised here that the buttons feel like they do. Not disappointed. <laughs> now, the shifters though, you hear that? Magnetic shifters, how about that? And I have to say they, they, they have a good little tactile click to them. And the force to pull them is not like real light. Again, a little surprised at that. I thought they would be a little lighter. Now they're kind of loud, but they're not as loud as they could be. They actually went and put some rubber pieces in here. You can see down there, see in there between the shifter, little piece over here, that's a rubber. And there's one on the bottom down here also. So that's kind of a silencer, right? Trying to dampen that sound a bit. So if you're driving next to someone, it's not too intrusive, but it still might be. I'll tell you what, I like a magnetic shifter on all wheels. I think all wheels should have them. If you've ever used a magnetic shifter and then go back to a spring actuated, yeah, it just feels dead compared 
to what this feels like. This is very good tactile feel to these shifters. I'm, again, I'm a little bit surprised here that they feel as good as they do. And they're not like real flexy. I mean, I'm pushing some pressure on this thing once I have it down. I mean, I can flex it a little bit there. But because of the surface area, see how big the surface area is for this thing to hit when you actually action it? So that gives it a lot of support. And that's partially why it feels the way it does. It feels good. Like I said, I'm a little surprised that the shifters feel as good as they do. And the buttons have a tactile feedback to them. Yeah, how about that? Now, the rest of the, the wheel, you know, the motor part, We've got the usual stuff on the bottom here. We've got the desk mount insert there. That is metal, obviously. We've got our connectors here. We have our RJ12. We've got the USB and a power. And we got the old PS2 type design connector there. And we've got some routing pieces here for the wires. In the, in the manual, they show you pictures of where you're supposed to route this stuff, but you can do it any way you want to. Little Velcro piece here. This is very similar to the T248, as far as that design goes. Little vent holes here. Yeah, nothing really stands out. We've got some rubber tabs. And we've got three holes back there. I'm, I'm assuming it's probably holding the motor assembly. I know on the, one on the T128, or not the T128, the T248. They had that same setup but again once we get to the look inside we'll see got some vents holes on the front and yeah just yeah, it's just plasticky you yeah, know just feels very cheapish <laughs> as you might imagine you get a set of pedals with this they call these the t2pm pedal set oh by the way all of the the shifters here not all of the shifters here are actually hall contactless units so that should give it long life cycles i think most of the manufacturers are going to this stuff now. I mean, there's really no reason not to. But maybe some of the custom wheels are still using switches. But yeah, Hall effect's good. Should give it life cycle. It, it's pretty good. The pedals themselves, well, again, you know, nothing to write home about. It's just a big hunk and piece of plastic, including the pedals themselves. They did go to the trouble to mill out some supports here, cut some of the weight down, but still give it some strength in the plastic with all these different veins in here supporting them not a lot of pressure to push the throttle down but not super sloppy either and these are also contactless sensors in here as they say we'll take a look inside and see what that is the brake itself over here left foot braking actually a pretty good amount of pressure here well just my hand obviously but this is a good i would say this definitely qualifies as a sock racing set of pedals and yeah not real tacky or anything here with this pattern they have but it's supposed to keep it, your foot from slipping around, obviously, when you're using it. Anything on the bottom we want to see? Well, you can see the labeling on the bottom there. So, yeah, that's the T2 PM pedal. The cord, a nice, generous, long cord. Of course, the, you're going to have to connect these to the wheel because it is their own proprietary RJ12 design. And you can see... By proprietary, I mean they've taken the lock tab and they've moved it to the side of the connector. And of course, the hole in the wheel over here accommodates that. And this is an RJ12. And we know it's an RJ12 because all of the pins in here, if I can get the focus, focus for me. There we go. Well, all the pins in there are populated. All right. And there's six of them. If there was only four of them, it'd be called an RJ11, but this is an RJ12. So, yeah, nothing fancy here. A good length here. This is about, I think it was two meters when I measured it. Same with the cable that comes with the wheel to connect it to your Xbox or your PC, whatever you're using here. USB-C here, nothing special. No ferrite cores or anything like that. USB-A, of course, to USB-C. Oh, wait a minute, there you go. <laughs> Again, two meters. So, yeah, ample reach, which I like. It's better to have too much than not enough when it comes to setting up your controllers, for sure. They have a smaller USB dongle piece here. This is made to go into the wheel over here, like this, and then have this hanging out to plug in the other cable into. Even though you could snake the other cable in here if you wanted to, I'd imagine, without too much trouble. And they give us the power supply, of course, and 
a cord, and this is the North American cord with the 110 volt. And we have the power supply plug there. And the power supply itself looks like output is, is that 16 or 18? 18. 18.5 18. volts at 2.6 amps. Well, 2.54, but we just call it 2.6. So that tells me that, yeah, this can pull a little power, 48 watts. Interesting. I'm curious to see how this thing feels. So what else can we talk about? That's all the parts you get. Now, of course, we get the usual instructions, tell you how to hook everything up, you know, all that good stuff. And some kind of a Xbox flyer here that you can use to... Uh, I don't use Xbox, so it's... Uh, <laughs> something to, to join their ultimate program, which is something I've reading it here. It looks like you can play a lot of games, but it's a monthly charge. Your first month is for free. So if you want to try it, I guess if you're using S Xbox, and I'm sure they probably have something like that for the PlayStation. So yeah, um, hybrid motor in here, by the way, a hybrid drive rather, not motor. That means it's going to be like the 248, I would imagine, that had the gear and the belt in the system as far as how it's turning or driving the wheel, which is actually a kind of a nice setup, I think. You know, the Logitechs, the older Logitechs, they were just gear driven. They had their pluses as far as the detail you get over that system versus a belt driven system at the same power ratings. But they had a cogging to them because of the lash and the gears. You could feel that when you're driving it, even though you got good detail. But this system, and we'll see that once we do a look inside, has a belt also so the belt provides some damping to the gear mesh or the gear lash that's in that mesh and should smooth things out so it actually felt pretty good on the 248 for what it was so i'm very curious to see what this is going to do uh, anything else we want to talk about here oh there is some leds in here i'm not sure if they're going to work or not in my pc that's what i'll be running this on but there's four leds in there for the rpm indicators i know in xbox is supposed to work in some games there according to thrustmaster but i don't use xbox so I won't be using it on that. So yeah, that's about it for the closer look. Not a lot to see here. $200 for a wheel and a pedal set. I can't wait to get this thing set up and actually using it to see what they, they've actually come up with here. We have the 128 partially disassembled so we can see how this thing is working. First off, we'll see the main board sitting here and we have the connectors actually solder to or attached to this board it might be i'm thinking there's some pins on the other side there probably yeah there's some pins in there that are soldered on the other side of this to the board and it's all one piece that way now you can take this off it looks like but it doesn't look like plugs to me on this it looks like they're actually soldered i don't see any plug headers but it could be wrong but anyway that's how it's attached so We've got our power, and next to the power, you can see this is where the main power comes in. We have some capacitors here. These are 25 volt. Let's see, we've got a 100 microfarad and another 100 microfarad, it looks like. Both of them 25 volts, but they're different sizes. Looks like we've got an inductor here. The usual things we'll see in a power circuit as this power comes in, and it converts the power and modifies the power, smooths it, does all the magic to it before it sends it on its way which is back up to here. So this is the main plug here that's feeding the steering wheel itself with the LEDs and all that stuff. But you can see we've got another power circuit up here that is maintaining that plug and its voltage needs. But it also, I would say, is also servicing this plug here, which goes over to our motor. If we follow it over here, you can see that's the positive and negative for the motor. And we've got another, maybe a sensor, position sensor, Looks like something coming back over here and going down here. I'm trying to see if I can read what that is. Thermal sensor. Ha, huh, there we go. So this is a thermal sensor. And this is the main power coming off the board. And again, this is the second power circuit to service that. And you notice these are actually 50 volt capacitors. They're still 100 microfarad, I believe. Yeah, 100 microfarads. But we've got three of those and we've got some large resistors here so yeah this is looks like it's a step up power circuit here because we've only got 25 volts on the input interesting 
Anything else? In, oh, and this over here is the optical plug. And we'll talk about that just in a minute here after we get to see how this is working. The fan over here, 60 millimeter unit, and it is sucking air out of the case and blowing it out of the top of the vent holes that we saw on the top. So the bottom vent hole is for the intake. So it's helping that hot, hot air come out of the case or pushing it out really. And that's got a nice little ferrite core here. See this thing? See all the wraps they put on there on the wire? Because the fan can make noise. Obviously, fans are known for making noise. And they're doing their best to mitigate the EMI interference from that. That's pretty trick. I like that they actually went the extra step to do that. Now, this main plug that comes off of here is servicing the steering wheel. It comes up and goes into another ferrite core. And it's a very large one, as you can see. This is one of the, yeah, this is a clip-on ferrite core here. So it's not made into the cable. Then the cable comes out the other side of that, comes over to the back. And we can see here, they've done a little wrap around one of the standoffs in the plastic, this injection molded plastic here. So they've done a little wrap there that will limit how much this cord can be pulled this way, going towards the front of the steering wheel, because that's how the steering wheel is attached. And you can see there's some coils in there. See that coiled wire there? So that's a coiled wire that's feeding the steering wheel through the main center column here. And we'll look more at that once we get over to the steering wheel part. All right, so we got our motor here, and of course it's doing all the work. One motor, not a real big motor. It does have some numbers on it. And I don't know if you'll be able to see them because they're kind of in silver. I'll do my best to see if you guys can see that. It's hard for me to see it, and I don't have to look at it through the video. But anyway, there's some numbers on there. <laughs> yeah, it's really hard to see the way they're etched on there. So, yeah. Nothing fancy there with the motor. Now, we have a pinion gear coming off the shaft of the motor, which is not easy to see. I'm going to try to see if I can show you guys that. And the pinion is turning a belt, actually. It's not engaging the gears yet. Remember, this is a hybrid drive, so we've got belts and gears. So the belt part starts up here at the pinion, and I don't know, like I said, I might be able to show you that if I get the angle right. There, there you go. See the pinion? And you can see the black piece there that's the belt and that's the main gear that you see in the background there right that's actually being turned by a, a plastic gear and to see that we have to flip it upside down so let's take a look at that the wheel is steering wheel is loose so i gotta be careful in handling this i don't want it to fall all apart on me all right so i'm gonna grab this column again the same way all right so now here is the gear that the belt is turning uh, let's see if i can get that in there Okay, I think you see it there. All right. So you see a little gear on that? I can get a little closer here. It's hard to do this backwards on the uh, camera. But yeah, there's the pinion gear. It comes off of the gear that's being turned by the belt. You can see the black belt there on the rim of that gear. And then that's engaging with the main big gear back there. So that's where we get our gear drive from. So the final drive is the gear drive. So the power directly coming off the motor is provided by belt drive. Pretty slick, huh? All right, so this is an optical sensor. And I did take this off, so I wanted to show you guys how this is working. We've got two sets of gears, and really not a gear. You can see the bottom of the gear down in here. See that? I'm trying to get uh, some more light on it so you can see it better. There we go. So there's the gear. And then above that is not really a gear. It's just a bunch of fingers, if you will. And those fingers are going through an optical sensor so it can tell what the position of the wheel is. All right. And that's black. You can see it's kind of inside the white gear. Not the best way to see it, but uh, in person's better. <laughs> but uh, you get the idea. So here is the circuit board. Let's set this down for a second. And here is the optical sensor. See the optical sensor in there? A little pointer. So the optical sensor, actually this is the light. It's shining towards this guy. See the, the light shoots over towards this. And that light gets interrupted by those pins attached to the inside of the gear that we just saw. 
So as that is spinning, it's going through here and those pins are breaking that light beam, right? So this gives it the position sensing that it needs to have because this picks up that light and can determine what position it's at. Not only that, but it's contactless, so it should give very good life cycle. Now, as far as the dust accumulation and things like that, well, it's, you know, it's always a chance of that happening. Let's show you the other side of it while we're looking at it. You can see it is obviously a Thrustmaster board there. And that's our plug. Does it say sensor on it? No, it says sensor on the main board. But there's always a chance of dust accumulating over time. But because it's in the housing here, of course, all this is going to be covered when the housings are all back on it. But even then, this thing is sticking in here like this. So that light will shine down the sensors like we said before. But those teeth there, they're not that teeth. They're just little pins. So as I turn it, actually, let me go ahead and turn that so you can see it working. Right, so as those pins are going by, it's breaking the beam of light, and it's timing it and figuring out the position of the wheel that way. And this fits in here just like this. See these two pins? There's a pin here, and there's a pin over there. So it fits down in here on those pins so it gets located correctly before you put the screws on. And then we'll take our little cable here and plug it back in, right? Go ahead and take that back out. We don't want to let that fall out and cause any damage to it. So, yeah, pretty compact. You expect this from Thrustmaster, a very tidy little layout here. Of course, the board, everything looks very professionally done, you know, as far as a bunch of injection molded plastic can be, <laughs> as far as I know it looks. But, yeah, typical what I've seen from Thrustmaster over the years when we've done look inside. Now, let's talk about the steering wheel. Now, the steering wheel is still attached for a reason. It doesn't really come off. It comes off. There's a screw on the top of the shaft. Let me go ahead and show you that first. It goes in there, and there's a shaft. There's a screw on the bottom of the shaft right in there. Okay. But once you get those off, you still got a bit of a struggle. This thing is on tight. I mean, it is really tight. Of course, not a, now it's not as tight because it's, it's just barely stuck back on. But I'm going to pull this off and show you what I mean by it doesn't really come off. Well, first, before I do that, this is the main cable coming out, obviously, right? If you notice right here, this piece here is, I'm not sure how they've got it affixed to the plug that's on the other side, but it does not want to come off. And I know how to get these plugs off, usually with heat or whatever, but it doesn't want to come off. And then I, when I opened this, I kind of saw why. There's a plate that is attached to that plug on the other side, and I'll show you the plug in a second. But you can see they've actually got two pins here, plastic pins, that they've melted to act as rivets. So they've melted that plastic pin against this piece of plastic here, right? So that's like a rivet now. And this piece here is somehow part of that plug assembly. I'm going to gently take this off. Remember, the idea is to put this all back together and it works. <laughs> Every chance I get anyway. And now you can see why they coil this wire in here in the column back there. Remember the coil? See it there? So when we pull this out, it can come out a little ways, right? So you can work on things like that. But there's the plug. And it looks like a typical, well, let me get a better look at it. It looks like a typical, to me anyway, PS2 type plug that was, you know, you, that actually the shifter uses when it plugs onto this wheelbase. So that's what it looks like in there. But it will not come off very easily at all. I've, I've done my usual tricks to trying to get that to work, but it didn't. So I stopped before I broke something. And then I said, well, there's gotta be another something. At first I thought there were screws on that plate, but no, they've actually melted that down. So there's no taking that off, which means the only way to get it off really is to go back over here and pull the main plug off, right? And then we can take this whole thing. We probably, and that's probably why this is a clip on. Now that I'm thinking about it, this clip on ferrite, we can take that back off, you know, kill the little zip tie here and unclip that, it will come off, and then this plug will fit through this column all the way out the other end. So it seems to me when you get a replacement steering wheel, or if they're rebuilding them or fixing them under warranty, wherever the case may be, this wheel and the cable come as an integral unit, right? 
So then they, they would fix it that way. Now, there's a lot of screws to get this thing off, no less than, what was it, 16 screws on this wheel on the perimeter and inside here on the hub area. So there's a lot of screws. If you have to take this apart, it's going to be something you really need to take care in what you're doing with your screws so you don't lose them. Now let's talk about the shifters while we have this off. Now I did have to take this guy off. It fits in there like this, all right? And that keeps the shifters assemblies from coming off. They're just paddles, really. I'll pull this back off and show you what I mean. See if we can get one of these to come out. So here is a little magnet here. I think that's a magnet, yeah. Well, it's stainless, I wouldn't know with that. Yeah, it's a little magnet there. So when we actuate this thing, it does this, right? But this piece here, the square piece, keeps this from jumping out. And we can see that there's actually some pretty good dobs of grease on this. Let me pull this out down in there. You see the grease where this thing is rusting? See where it rusts? Let me pull that out. Got some good silicone, clean looking grease in there. And this will come out, I believe, simply by doing this. And you'll notice that we have a magnet in here, right there. So that's our magnetic shifter, right? And on the other side where we're pulling it, there's another magnet. So it pulls it, snaps it shut. And we've got some little ribbing in here to try to give some structural integrity to the shifter. And it is, you know, I am surprised at the stiffness of the shifter paddle. It's actually pretty nice to use and it's got a good click to it. It might be a little bit loud for some, but you know, magnetic shifters are like that. And we have, they did go ahead and pre-install these rubber pieces here. You got a piece there and a piece there to try to show you before in the closer look, we can see much better now. And so we got a little magnet up here. Maybe that's for return or something. Or no, that's, that's the button activation. That's what that is. So when we're pulling it, yeah. This actually pushes in on the button that makes the shift. So that may not even be a magnet. All right. So yeah, plastic, but thick plastic, as you can see, and it's got ribbing. So when you're using it, it does feel very solid. And I said that before. Not only that, but this area here, right in here, is landing on a very large area on the wheel, on the back. Go ahead and pull it off now that I have it on there. Yeah, this is not the easiest thing to do. All right. So inside the wheel itself, it's got this ledge. See that ledge in there? So this is landing on that ledge, this part here where the ribs are, as we pull it to ourselves. So again, that's what another reason why it has such a solid feel. It's not some little thin lever coming out like this, you know, right, that would be flexy. So they did a good job with the design of this. I like what I'm seeing here, actually to make it feel like it does. And like I said, it's a, actually pretty much of a pleasure to use these shifters. Especially considering some of the shifters that are on these cheap wheels. What else are you gonna say about this one? It's a cheap wheel, it was designed to be one, right? So what else can we talk about? Oh yeah, let's talk about the circuit board. I took that off. Let's set this aside. And here's the circuit board right here. Very clean looking, as you might imagine. Again, Thrustmaster stuff, you know, the way they produce stuff is very good. We've got a plug here. This is the plug that's coming out of the steering wheel. We've got a STM32 processor here handling all of the commands. And we've got your associated, uh, actually, these are little transistors here. I don't know how are you going to see that, but uh, you can see the little three prongs, two on one side and one on the other. And I also noticed that we've got quite a bit of unused pads here. See those? Right in here. Go backwards. Okay. Right in there. See those pads? Now those pads are also transistor pads because they're in triangle figure configuration. You got one and then two, one and two. They're in sets of three, if you will. So interesting. And we've got some other pads here that are T7 through 10. Or, yeah, 6 through 10. And if you turn that around, that's for debugging. You can see there's a debug label there. And these are probably in the traces on the other side from those. So they can actually test things out as they're building it. And of course, we've got our LEDs out front here. Now these button pads, this is how the buttons work. And they have a tactile, I was telling you in the closer look. They have a pretty decent little tactile feel. 
especially for a $200 steering wheel system, that most of these wheels, even like I said, ex more expensive wheels than this, you push it and it's like, it's just a stop at the end when you push the button, no clicks, no tactile feel to it at all or anything like that. But here, when we press these, and I'll show you how that works, but how this works on the buttons, you can see we've got, oh, well, I can see this, but there's actually, each side of this is its own set of traces. All right, so they don't actually touch. I hope that's showing up in the video well enough. So those things don't actually touch until the button's pressed on top of that, this whole area here, and that makes the connection. And then obviously we action the button and the chip picks it up and does what it's supposed to do. So how does that work with that tactile piece? Well, here's the back of the steering wheel and that's where all our buttons are, right? Sands the shifters and it has these silicone membranes on it. I took one loose. They just go right onto these little studs here and push back on. And once you do that though, you have to be very, very careful because now the buttons inside the wheel are loose and they will fall right out. You got a mess. You got to turn around, put them back in the right order. So yeah, you got to be careful when you do this stuff, even though that could still happen while I'm messing with it. But here's, this is the coolest thing is the way this is working. They set this up. This membrane has these little spot, these little pieces here. Now they have to be either carbon or some kind of conductive material in there. All right. I get a focus on it. These little guys here, where's my pointer? Little black pieces there. If we can get this thing to focus. So there has to be some kind of a metallic or conductive material on these surfaces, obviously, because when it makes contact with the, what we just saw, then it makes the connection, right? So the electricity or current can flow through that and make the connection. But here's how it works. This is the other side of it. All right, you can see them hanging in there. And there's this thin piece or section of it. It's pretty thick here. It's opaque. You can even see through it. We can see it through it a little bit. But this part of it, I may even get you to see that one there. It's got, it's kind of thinnish right there on this part of it. All right. So when we push this button, the button behind it, and it pushes up on it, it kind of punches through. That's a better way to, let me get the middle one. It punches through a little better. So I'm going to do that one. See that? It punches through that thinner membrane, and you can feel it with your finger when you do that. And that's where we're getting that tactile click from. I think you can hear it. <laughs> anyway, so that's how it works. I think you can hear it better there. Yeah. So yeah, and it's just a silicone sheet, obviously designed to do exactly what it's doing. So I thought that was pretty cool when I saw that. Anyway, what else can we talk about? I think that's it. Yeah, I think we covered it all. And this will, let me put this back on here. This goes back onto these little guides or standoffs. Real easy. Get back on that one. All right, so now that it's affixed, when we do our button presses, it's going to well, we don't have the backing part, you know, the, the back part over here, when it's together, it, it holds it down tighter. Whoop, here goes when I switch it. See, see what I'm saying? <laughs> At least it was just one. So, yeah, and it doesn't really click yet because there's no, nothing holding. It's not, there's a flat piece back here that keeps that kind of flattish, and then these will come out and punch on that circuit board or make contact with the circuit board. All right. I think we covered everything that we could on the look inside for the 128 or T128 wheel from Thrustmaster. Now we'll take a look inside of the pedal set, the T2PMs. And first we'll look at the pedals themselves and the housings here. They kind of sit up here upside down, but we can see it's pretty simple what's going on here. We've got two different springs and the springs are different widths. These springs make contact to the bottom of this plate. We'll see that in a second. And I'm going to pull the springs out first. Be very careful here because these pedals are just sitting here very loosely. So this is the throttle. This is the brake. And you can see they've simply just added a thicker spring on the brake than there is on the throttle. You can see the different thicknesses there, I believe. A thicker one being on top. 
and the throttle one, which is thinner, being on the bottom. So that's pretty much all we get for resistance. But gets the job done, right? I'm going to put the springs over here. I'm pull one of these pedals out if I can. Let's see. Goes, I think it comes out the back. There we go. Well, I can turn it sideways. There we go. I just kind of turned it sideways and it came out. So here's the pedal. It has this little stop lever here that stops on the back of the main plate here. And that also has a little... <laughs> it's going to fall out too. A little rubber bumper there. They both have these rubber bumpers. So when re it returns, comes back, the sound is obviously muted because of those rubber pieces in there. Put you back in there. And you can see this piece here is just a grease piece of plastic on both sides of this that rotates in these little indentations. Let me keep this guy from falling out this time. Right in here. There's a little indentations. Oh, well, that's going to show up, but it's just little grooves, basically, right? It's not a whole lot to them there on both sides. So it kind of sits down in there. All right. Now, another thing of note here is the magnet that's embedded in there. It looks like they put a dab of hot glue or something on it to keep it from wandering off somewhere. Just remember, these are contactless sensors on this deal so it has to have a magnet right so there's our magnet so now that we saw that we can go over here and look at the board itself and here's the sensor turn this around so we can see it where's my pointer there it is so there's the sensor the magnetic pickup part is on this side because as the pedal comes that pushes down that magnet goes past that piece there and it picks it up and can tell how far it is. It gives it a position, in other words. So it calculates the position, and of course that's going to be sent off to the wiring harness through our cable here into the wheelbase plug. And then of course it's going to convert it to a signal that USB can understand and send it to the PC. Pretty simple, really. And we also have some rubber bumps here and here. And these are the balls that the other spring lands on. So it retains the spring when we put this back in and put the screws back in and tighten everything up. So we got some tape, regular kind of tape for some basic cable management here. Now I did take one of the sensors out so we get a closer look at it. Not a lot to it, but you can see the magnetic pickup part of it is here. Whoops, wrong side. Right in here. I can get this thing to focus for me. And you can see it's got these little strips there. So it calculates that magnetic field and can tell by the strength of the magnetic field from the magnet where it is as far as the position. And the other side is just plain plastic. Doesn't have the sensor. You can see the sensor is embedded in the top here. Well, this thing doesn't want to focus for me. Come on. There it is. And of course on the other side it's just regular plastic. And we've got some Supporting components in here, surface mount stuff. Very clean. Now again, we expect from Thrustmaster. And it is Thrustmaster's name on the back there, that little circuit board. So, yeah, pretty simple, and I thought it would be, <laughs> as far as what's going on here and the electronics involved. And, yeah, so I don't see any wear marks. I was looking to see if there's any wear marks anywhere so far. I've put a few hours on these, but yeah, everything looks very clean here. I don't see any stress anywhere. So and again, there's not a lot of pressure you put on these pedals when you're using them anyway. That's why I ran them with socks because they were so light that really that's the only way I felt like I could halfway control the car with the uh, positional brake because I'm used to pressure type of brakes. And yeah, the positional one took a while for me to get used to. So yeah, I guess that'll wrap up our look inside in the on the pedal set, there's really, like I said, not a lot to see here. Now we'll look at our mounting options for this T128 kit. Let's talk about the wheelbase first. Now, typically, and even on the 248 when I had that, there was a couple of holes in here, and you can see the holes. But there was some inserts that had threads on them, threaded inserts. Here we do not have that. So there will be no bolting this down to anything. It's just smooth bore in there. 
So this is what we're going to be using, the table clamp, <laughs> this guy. And this works fine. It's got a pretty decent system to it. It's got this big, long threaded bolt here with the little lever that we use to clamp down on it. And this is a M10 bolt, 1.5 pitch, I believe. And this is going to fit in here like this. And the ball is going to go in here. And then we just clamp it down. Now, I'm going to be mounting this to a deck mount on a profile cockpit. So, yeah, it might not be thick enough on my deck mount because it's kind of thin, 10 millimeters. But you can always put it like a piece of wood underneath it, in between, rather. And then you can clamp it down and work fine. So, yeah, no bolting this one. We're going to be using the table clamp. And I'll show you that once I have it mounted. A little surprised at that, that they didn't put the threaded inserts in there. All right, so the pedals also have really no mounting solution. You know, they're made to sit under a desk, really, if you think about it. And you can see the angle on them is pretty steep, too, because of that. There are some holes. Now, there are some holes under here, and they do have some metal to them. I don't know if you can see that metal in there. Yeah, I think you can see that. Anyway, that is not threaded either, so we're not going to be using that. That's just that we can see the metal plate that's supporting the assemblies of the pedals on the bottom here. We'll take a closer look at that, obviously, when we get to the look inside. But we do have two holes here. Now, these holes are at this part of the injection molded plastic. It's 30 millimeters thick right here. And we have these little rubber feet on the bottom. And that keeps it from sliding around on your floors when you have it under your desk. I'm not sure how well that's going to work on carpet, but... Yeah, there's ways to get around that if you need to bolster them up and keep them from sliding around. But anyway, they don't give you any hardware, though. They don't give you any fasteners to attach these. I'm going to be attaching these to some profile. So I went to my bolt and screws parts bin, spare parts bin. I got a bunch of these and found uh, some 40, I believe these are 40 millimeter. And they will fit in here. Now, they are socket head caps, so they will stick up a little bit. But I don't think they're going to interfere with activating these pedals themselves when they're actioning them. And I'll have about 10 millimeters minus the pad height. You can see the pads kind of stick up a little bit here on the bottom. So I'll still have about 5 millimeters engaging. Hopefully that's going to be deep enough to get to the T-nut. If not, then I'm going to have to source something a little bit longer than this, maybe 45. So this is how I intend to mount them. So hopefully I'm successful. I'll know that once I get it over there. So yeah, not a lot to the mounting here, as you might imagine. Um, again, a little disappointed they didn't put some threaded inserts in there, so I could just bolt it directly to my deck over there, the wheel deck. But yeah, we'll be using this guy. So when we get back, we'll see how that goes. So the pedal mount turned out just like I thought it would. It's bolted nice and securely in our holes here. And of course, we have some T-nuts underneath attaching it to this profile. I have it resting on the profile back here as far as the back part of this plastic frame. So, yeah, it's about as securely as you'll ever get these pedals mounted to something. And there's still some flex in the front here and in the back. Let me show you there. See if you can see that moving. Let me get it down lower. But when you press on the pedal, yes, yeah, it's, it's not moving. At least not much anything that I can really see. Maybe just a hair on the brake pedal, but not something that's going to make a difference when we're actually using the pedals, I don't think. So yeah, nice and secure, just the way we like it. I'll be using probably socks on these pedals. They're so easy to push. I can't really feel them with my shoes on. All right, so back up to the 128 wheel. And of course, we use the clamp. This is a 10 millimeter thick aluminum plate here, so the clamp is doing its job quite well. Obviously, it's all plastic, so there's still going to be some flex in this thing. I mean, it is what it is, right? <laughs> it's not much you can do to change that. I could probably put a block of wood under there, Maybe tighten it up a little better, but I just don't know. I'm going to try it, but I don't think it's going to make much of a difference. But the angle is good. Of course, being on the rig that I have, it's easy to adjust and get the angle and the reach done properly. So, yeah, everything's secure now. All I have to do is get in and do some testing. So this is the Thrustmaster T128X control panel. <laughs> I'm not sure what the X is for. But, yeah, this is the basic driver package that you get when you download their software and install it on your computer and this is on a windows computer of course so what do we have here well first off we've got 
in representation of the steering wheel as it turns. Now, one thing about this, when you first power this steering wheel up, and I'll show you guys a little B-roll here, this steering wheel certainly does turn left and right a pretty good amount. So you wanna make sure that you don't have any fingers or hands on this when it first boots up. And make sure the kids are away from it too, because it definitely moves a lot. Anyway, so back to this, we can see that I'm moving the wheel, right? Here we can choose our rotation angle, 900 down to 140 degrees depending on what you want to do. And you can test our buttons and our shifters and things like that while we're up here. The shifters work in these little green boxes on the bottom there will look, light up and show us what we're doing. Everything seems to be working except for, I believe it's these top ones here. Yeah, they're not working. The bottom ones work, the Xbox controls, but the D-pad works fine. And of course our XYBs, our XYBA and our LSBs down here work. So everything's working except for these two. So we do lose two mappable inputs when we're on the PC. But other than that, everything's fine. And if I obviously put my foot on the throttle, you can see the RZ axis is moving and the brake is the Y axis. And you can see that's moving too. That's pretty much it. There's not much else to see here really. So next page is test forces. And of course, this is where you can test the forces. I usually don't mess with this, but you can test it by clicking on something over here, or you can just push a button. Like if I push this, what are they calling this? Their handbrake button, but it, it has the hazard sign on it, but I'll press that and you can see it moves. It does some direct drive stuff. It doesn't park back where I had it originally, but that's not a big deal. So anyway, you can push some of these buttons around here and it makes things happen to the wheel just to make sure that everything's functioning as it should. So that pretty much covers the testing tab. So now we'll go over to the gains setting tab. When I first opened this, overall strength forces is 75%. Now, if you go down to default and click on that, it goes to 65%. That's interesting that they don't have it at the minimum when they, or at least at 65%, obviously it's not the minimum, but they don't have it at default. It's actually 10 points higher when you open it. So anyway, I'm gonna have this at 100%, obviously. There's not gonna be that much newt meters available. And we'll have everything else at 100% down here. Now we have auto center settings. This is totally personal preference stuff here, very subjective. Depends on how you like to feel this wheel when it's turning. Of course, I don't know if I want any or not. I have to use it first, obviously, before I can make that determination. So I'm just gonna leave it at the default right now for that portion of it. So yeah, not much else to see here on the driver. And you know, the pedals are kind of mounted. They're very secure actually on this profile and they feel pretty solid. They do feel not very hard to press, <laughs> especially with a shoe on. I might take my, my shoes off and drive with socks on this because you can get a better feel. They're so light that it's probably the best way to drive these pedals. And you know, we'll see that once I get up and I'm driving and try to figure out what's the best way for me to do this. And we'll get to that next. So we're in iRacing in the Ferrari 488 GT3 Legacy car. And we're at Sebring for my usual testing setup. So I can determine what this direct drive wheel is doing as far as output. I am using my socking feet, or socked feet. <laughs> I take my shoes off because these pedals are pretty light. So this is a great set of pedals if you like to drive in your socks, no doubt. It allows me to feel what's going on in the pedals as best I can without a shoe on, obviously. So anyway, let's go ahead and get out there first. A quick shot of what I'm doing here as far as the gain settings on the Thrustmaster driver or software. And I'm at 95% for overall strength. The reason I do that, I usually back it off a few percentage points from 100% on everything I use, even direct drive wheels, just to keep them from over driving and clipping and maybe missing out on some of the detail because it's trying to push 100% to the wheel. Although in the higher end direct drive wheels, I don't think it makes that much difference. But in something like this that doesn't have much torque at all. In fact, I have it about five and a half pounds of torque. I'm guessing that's what the peak is on this. I don't have any information to tell me different. So I'm just going to drive it like that. Doing what I can with what I have to work with here. So let's go ahead and get on the track. First off, I have this at 23 Newton meters here on the settings for iRacing. You can actually feel the force feedback, obviously. There is resistance when I'm turning the wheel. But I'm not really feeling any weight transfer in the wheel. 
So that's one thing that uh, seems to be missing. Now, there might be some of it there, but it's so faint, I just can't feel it. But here's the thing also, as I'm doing this and running this in here, and I'm going to do a set of corset too, is that somebody coming from like a game controller or something like that, or somebody who's never used a force feedback wheel at all in any kind of racing games or whatever, then they might be able to feel a little bit more than what I'm feeling because I'm used to much higher powered direct drive systems. So I'm trying to adapt to that. Even though I've already got a few hours on the system playing around with it, I still don't feel totally comfortable with the faintness that I'm getting on the details. See, I felt that, but the first turn, there was nothing there. I didn't feel anything, but I felt it on the other curve. And as I go over this, I can't feel anything. There was nothing there. However, I've noticed that when I speed up and I'm actually driving at speed or close to my normal speeds, then that's where things start coming alive. I can feel them a little more, but they're just not that pronounced as I would like them to be. But again, I'm having to keep reminding myself, look, this is a entry level. See, I was able to recover from that, but I'm, what I'm feeling, the wheel is so faint. I'm not sure if it's my visual that's making recovery, re doing the inputs to correct for that slide, or if it's the visuals plus something that I'm feeling in the wheel itself. See, I really don't, and I felt, when you're sliding across the grass, you felt that, but when I was sliding on the asphalt, there was nothing there. I'm just kind of driving around here now. And I'm not feeling weight transfer. So I should be feeling a little weight transfer, I think, when I'm going around the curves. And that's what, one of the things that I like to feel. But then again, and there's no, there's no rumble strips there at all. And I've got everything turned up on the detail gain settings at 100%. So whatever the telemetry feed is coming from iRacing, that's what we're getting. And whatever their firmware is putting on top of that with the adjustments at 100% on that on those gains, which I'm not sure what that is, obviously. But see, I don't feel any loading of the suspension from the weight of the car as the G-force is pulling it down, but I do feel the bumps coming down the straight. They're definitely there. So it's, it's almost like the firmware is written because of the, the low power. It's deciding what it picks and chooses to deliver to the wheels force feedback feel. In other words, it's making a priority choice. <laughs> it's, it's prioritizing what it's going to give you. Like when I'm off road there, I felt that. If I go off here, I drop a wheel, I feel a boom, 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 because I'm in the grass, in the dirt. Of course, there's nothing here, so everything's just smooth here. But when I go back and forth, there's really no change in the direct, you know, the force feedback, rather, of the wheel itself, as far as the strength goes. And I didn't feel hardly anything there, but I felt pretty good there. And I can feel all this here. So it's, it's intermittent. So again, back to my theory, I think they're trying to prioritize what they think you need as far as force feedback information to control the car and run it successfully. Felt, felt that. Didn't feel that. I dro usually drop off that dirt a little bit. Felt that. Felt the corner clip. Not very strong. No rumble at all here. And Well, maybe just faint. Just very faint. But usually I get a good rumble on that rumble strip there. Another thing that I noticed is that you feel more of the bump when it's coming off the bump. Now that's a good bump there, it's very sharp, and I'm, the reason I went over that is because I've been doing it, trying to figure out what I can feel and what I can't feel. And there's a little bit there, but if this rumble strip here should be rumbling like crazy, and yeah, I don't get anything but smoothness there. Maybe just a faint bit of motion. Now once I get up to speed, I think, at least I think I feel, a little bit more. And especially on the transitions from concrete to asphalt, once I get over there, get back over there, we'll talk about that real quick.
But see, I know this track so well, I know where the tendency of this car is to slide. And I'm, I'm just not, it just doesn't feel like to me that I'm, I'm getting the input of the lightness in the wheel like I would expect it normally. So I'm kind of reacting to my visuals, I think, more than anything. But regardless, the main thing here, obviously, is I can control the car and I can drive it. I can't drive it to my usual speed because the brake pedal is really messing with me here. <laughs> I'm just too used to pressure-based brake pedals, but somebody coming from no pedals at all would probably have no problem with this. Would probably outbreak me like crazy. <laughs> I would definitely expect that. So I'm, you know, it's all position on this kind of stuff, right? It's where your position of your foot is, and you get used to that. See, not much there. Good there. Decent there. I even felt a little rumble. Now at speed, I'm feeling a little transition there when I came across that and that. Where you usually feel a good transition from the asphalt to the concrete on other wheels that I've tested. But there I didn't feel anything. There I did feel it. I'll go off the dirt a little bit there. Yeah. Again, it's pretty faint. Again, we don't have a lot of power though, so I have to keep everything in perspective here, I think. I think I do feel a little bit of, of some a difference in the force feedback when it gets loose like that, which starts my input correction. Yeah, I didn't feel much over that one, but I feel a lot on this one. So it's almost like the right side I'm getting more. Of course, I can't say that for sure. And here's another thing. As I was turning through that rumble strip, in other words, I was still in the turn, when I was loading up the suspension, I felt the rumble strips. Not real, a lot of them, you know, it wasn't anything big, but they were there then. But as soon as I straightened the car, as soon as I came out of that curve a little bit and started straightening up and going across it, it went away. So again, this is, has to do with the way the firmware is, is written. Of course, at the end of the day, what really matters is, can you get in here with this controller and these pedals and drive the car fast? I believe the answer is definitely yes here. Definitely feeling some bumps going, again, down the straight here. So I think, really, the more I think about it and ponder it, the hours I've put onto this wheel, I'm thinking that they've kind of been successful at what I think they were trying to do here, and that is to get a very inexpensive wheel into the hands of people who haven't had a wheel before. Because if you've had a decent wheel in your hands before, of course, this feels like a total toy. But to somebody uninitiated, it could feel like, wow, this is the best thing since whatever, right? And I can I get that because there was a time in my life, believe it or not, that I actually was on this kind of equipment and was loving it. <laughs> All right, so that's enough for iRacing. I'd really want to go over to a set of Corsa and see what the differences are. So we'll do that next. So now we're in a set of Corsa Competizione. And we're going ahead and drive this for a while and see what the differences are. Now, there are, as far as the settings go, I'm going to show you what the settings are for my setup, of course, the setup that I'm driving at currently. And also, I have the exact same driver, Thrustmaster driver settings set up. So, we'll see how this thing reacts. Already, the force feedback, the transition from left to right around center feels more sharp. I guess is a good word for it. So we'll go ahead and get on the track here. All right. So the rumble strips are really good here in a set of Corsa. Although the dirt feels different for some reason than iRacing. It, it's smoother, I guess, it feels, than it does from Sebring going off the track in the grass. Although this is all dirt, maybe that makes the difference. But the first thing you notice about it is the rumble strips are much sharper. It seems to be more things, just more pronounced and detailed. If I can drive and talk at the same time here. Than it is in iRacing at the same settings but of course inside the games themselves the settings are going to be a little different because of the way that they 
are designed. Remember, we got 60 hertz in iRacing for the force feedback, and I'm not sure, I can't remember what that set of course is, but it's faster than iRacing. So that might be why we're feeling the difference here. Now, what I'm really looking for when I'm driving a car is, do I get weight transfer? It feels a little light right there when I was going back and forth and the car was sliding, which is something you want. And that gives you an indication that the car is losing grip on the front, and you can start your correcting inputs straight away to make sure that you don't slide. But they are faint. I believe I can feel them more here in a set of Corsa than I could in iRacing. And that might be because of the different type of force feedback rates that we're getting. But still, it's vague. And again, I'm not expecting much here from a $200 wheel. But I will say the rumble strips are very good. And I'm not feeling a lot when I ran off there. Let's see if drop one over here. It's very smooth here, but again, it's, it's dirt, maybe some gravel too. So that might make the difference as far as not getting really bumpy as you go off track. I hit that sausage. Yeah, I, I think I'm feeling some looseness that I couldn't feel in eye racing on this. That's what that felt like when it got loose there. But again, I'm relying a lot on my visuals here when I'm driving this car with this wheel, or any of the cars with the wheel. Because it's just, like I said, the power is just not here for that, and you don't expect that. But, I am able to pretty much control the car the way I want to. I'm not going to do the same kind of lap times I do with my daily driving equipment, obviously. I guess the most pronounced thing that I'm feeling the difference is, is it just seems sharper overall. Rumble strips, the transition from left to right through center is sharper feeling, more resistance. And I think that I can feel the looseness now more than I could feel it in iRacing. Yeah. See, I hit that sausage. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. The thing was, I hit that sausage, but I couldn't feel it. I could see the car taking the hit and the suspension taking the hit, but I couldn't feel it. It was just felt like I was just losing some steering control. It didn't feel like I was actually taking a hit off of uh, some furniture on the circuit like I did. But you sure can feel those rumble strips straight away. So yeah, you know, there's, as far as the difference, there is, and it's pretty easy to tell straight away between these two games. And the wheel is pretty much doing what it's supposed to be doing. Yeah, I hit that sausage there, but I, you could see it, the wheel didn't even hardly jump. I didn't even hardly feel anything there. Let's try this one. Yeah, it's just very smooth, <laughs> which is great for driving fast. I mean, if you're just looking to be a really fast driver, there's a lot of guys who are aliens. Well, maybe not a lot, but the guys who are aliens, a lot of them are using wheels in this type of force feedback range because they can do that without it jerking on their hands. You know, if you take a 20 newton meter, 25 newton meter direct drive, even 15 newton meter at full power and hit those sausages like that, it's going to jerk your hands pretty good. <laughs> so you try to stay off of them just for, because of that reason. And that's what you would be doing in real life racing, obviously. So that's where the immersion comes in with the more powerful wheels. But again, I think Thrustmaster has done what they set out to do here. I think I said that in the iRacing driving segment, that you know they want to get a wheel that is a wheel with pedals, this force feedback that is currently, I believe, with pedals like this, probably the cheapest that you can buy. And I, it's really oriented at people who 
have been looking at sim racing and maybe getting into it or sim racing on their PlayStations and their Xboxes, they've been using game controllers for that, the thumbs and stuff, right? And they're looking to get out of that and get into a wheel. And this is relatively affordable move up, you know, 200 bucks. And you find out you don't like it, then you could probably always sell it and get, you know, 100 bucks for it in the secondhand market, right? Used. I would think somebody would pay that for this. So you're not going to lose a lot of money if you decide it's not for you. But it definitely is better than using thumb controllers, believe it or not. Even though I know there's some people that use thumb controllers in iRacing. I'm not sure about a set of Corsa, but you can use them in a set of Corsa too, obviously. But yeah. Nothing like having a wheel in hand and bolted to something as far as fast and securely. Definitely more immersive. So this will, I think, do the trick. See, I didn't even hardly, you see the wheel didn't even move when I went over that sausage. So it just, it's, I think the way the firmware is programmed, they're not really caring about that kind of stuff. But the little things like the rumble strips, yeah. Boom. I mean, look at how the car sh shot it took and it just... Gave me a little notch <laughs> in the wheel. So, yeah, you're not going to hurt yourself going over the curbing and stuff. And you're probably going to hurt the car, which if you're in a game that has realistic modeling, your car's not going to last anyway, no matter if you are trying to drop over those and cut the corners as much as you can and, you know, get to the track limits. And that lets you drive faster. But, yeah, if you got some realism turned on, it's going to tear up your suspension anyway, so it's not going to do any good. All right, so, yeah, AC, I think it's better feeling overall. In a set of Corsa Compensazione. So, yeah. I think, again, Thrustmaster has done what they set out to do here as far as creating this product. Final thoughts on the T128 Force Feedback Wheel Kit from Thrustmaster. At a price point of $200, Thrustmaster is positioning the T128 squarely at the low end sim racing controller market. Intended for those who are thinking of trying sim racing or those who currently sim race using a handheld controller and want to take it to the next level. Out of the box, the T128 wheel and T2PM pedals present as an all injection molded plastic unit. Fit and finish is as good as you can expect from this kind of manufacturing process. The T128 is light, coming in at 4 pounds 6 ounces or 2 kilos. This is the PC Xbox version of the T128. There will also be a PC PlayStation version available. The steering wheel is all plastic with no added material to the rim. There are 19 buttons, including the shifters for mapping to game functions. The buttons themselves did surprise me, as they actually have a tactile click to them when actioned. I was expecting the usual dead feeling buttons on other wheels that have a single stroke until you hit the stop. The shifters were also a nice surprise at this price point. They are contactless magnetic units that have a satisfying click to them when actioned. They also feel pretty solid. This because the lever stop has a large contact surface area. The force feedback provided by the T128 is good enough to be able to properly control the car you are driving. I did find it a bit vague when it came to road surface feel and weight transfer sensations. Nothing inspiring here, but certainly usable for the type of sim racer this kit is intended for. This wheel is a hybrid drive design. This starts with a belt drive on the motor shaft and ends with a gear drive on the main steering column. They also use an optical positioning system similar in function to those found in some anti-lock brake systems. The T2PM pedals are again constructed from cheap feeling injection molded plastic. They do have contactless position sensors in them which should give longer life cycles than the previously used potentiometers. They are very light feeling underfoot, so much so I drove them with only my socks on which might be a great thing for most entry-level drivers. Overall, I think that Thrustmaster has achieved what they set out to do here with the T128 kit, an affordable solution for the entry-level sim racer. I'm Barry Rowland. Thanks again for watching the Sim Racing Garage channel. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you would like to help support what I do here at the SRG, visit my website at simracinggarage.com.